Alrighty. Welcome to the Celtics Lab Podcast, brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network and BetterHelp. You deserve to be happy. I'm Cameron Tempatai. I'm your host. I'm joined by Dr. Justin Quinn. And for the moment, we are indeed happy. Boston Celtics not only won game four and staved off what would have been like a super embarrassing sweep, but uh, I think there were some encouraging things that we saw from that win. So Dr. Quinn and I, you got Dr. Q and Mr. T on the horn. We're going to talk about what we saw in game four, how much of it is sustainable, expectations for game five, and Woj and Shams must not have been watching because they were talking about coaches the whole game. So maybe we'll talk about head coaches as well. Please like and subscribe to our podcast if you haven't already. It makes a huge difference. And then I don't have to waste time begging for likes or subscribes. Justin, how are you? Uh, not begging for a win. That is definitely nice. Uh, cautiously optimistic, I think, is the best way to put it. Uh, I want to have this like mental shield that things are good, and I think they should too. So this doesn't... We'll, we'll we'll break the game down a little bit more for people who weren't able to watch, but for people who did watch, this might make more sense. At what point did you actually think they were going to win? Ooh, probably when they got under the three-minute mark with a double-digit lead. Uh, I really don't trust any leads for the Celtics in this series and in, in general uh, when they haven't been playing well. And, uh, well, they haven't been playing well all series, so I don't trust any lead they have. Yeah, that... I think we're on the five minute mark. Robert Williams had a big dunk and I was like, yeah. Ooh, that's it. And then Jimmy Butler went back and t- completed an and one. And it was like, Oh, that's not it. Um, people who listen to this podcast regularly know a, that you and I write for Celtics wire, but B sometimes when things are sticky, what you do for a game recap is you write about a loss and a win and <laughs> you just do double duty. And I didn't delete the information about the loss until Peyton Pritchard checked into the game. And in fact, I had a line that I didn't end up using that said Miami was able to erase a nine point fourth quarter lead. And then I added 11 point and then 17 point, because even when it was 17 points, uh, Boston's favor in the fourth quarter, I, I wasn't willing to believe it. Um, which I don't think says much about us as fans. I think that says a lot about how the Celtics have performed. <laughs> but we're not but, being fans in that role. Even though we are fans and we bracket it and try to give good objective analysis, as, at least as, as you can as a human being. Well, let me say this. It's not – yeah, we weren't being blinded by – look, we have professional stake in the Boston Celtics. We'd prefer they win. I mean, we could give unslanted coverage and say, like, it would be better for us if they won the game. Um, but, again, it's more it's just like, I don't know, since – the, the 2020s, you can't trust a lead with the Boston Celtics in the fourth quarter. So let's let's get a little more nitty-gritty with the game. Um, you can have turnovers. You can have Jason Tatum. You can have defense. You can have the bench. You can have three-point shooting. Pick something you want to talk about. I'll talk about ball movement since you didn't mention it. Mm-hmm. Because... Probably as much as anything, that was the key to this game. Uh, Defense really is what they built the foundation off of, and I would like it to be the case that I don't need to talk about it. We should probably talk about that too because it really set them up. Uh, It's like, uh, I don't know, uh, a fine wine and cheese pairing. If, If you have it, everyone at the party is excited, happy, things go great. If you don't have it, everyone's bummed out, and, well, you know how that ends. So for me, uh, just seeing the ball zip around early gave me some hope. There were plenty of lapses in concentration that flowed from defensive lapses that then kind of just like – I mean, I don't even know why I'm saying this because anyone who's ever listened to this podcast before has heard me say say this before – but this time there was a sense of urgency as if they realized they were going to, you know, have their season in. Yeah. The ball movement was a big, big deal. And like, so I'm not going to use an adverb. So absent in the first few games of the series, uh, per, sorry, preposterously. So, um, you know who I really credit for maybe not the ball movement, although he was, he was a participant in that, but really giving the Celtics a boost really in the second and third quarter was Grant Williams. Um, this is now the second time I think this series where the Celtics have looked flat or disinterested, or uh, I hate to play armchair psychologist. I do not know Jason Tatum as a person at all, but he looked like a person who was uncomfortable with the situation. And most of the Celtics did in the first half. Grant came in, a lot of hustle. I mean, he took 
you know, that bad charge take. I mean, it wasn't perfect, but I think he really injected the team with a lot of energy. I credit Derek White with helping with that ball movement a lot. He had a really nice game. Um, yeah, no, I thought, I mean, the headline, I suppose, is the Celtics finally found their stroke and they actually hit some threes, but they only hit like 40 something percent like low 40s which is a huge clip but not, not you know what like miami's shooting whatever it is 48 percent for the series so yeah that that's a good one anything else on the offensive end you want to shout out hmm offensively there were back cuts there were paint touches all the aspects of what we've called good missoula ball everyone was involved uh everyone was putting forth Really good effort. Uh, Malcolm Brogdon is still lost in this series, and I'm not really yeah. sure if he's ever going to be effective in this series. So maybe they need to just let him have a little bit less of a role moving forward. Uh, I'm not really sure the best way to use him, but between his defensive lapses and his, his inability to connect with other players, uh, he's mostly only going for his own offense, and even that isn't going very well. So, you know, I, I'm not – advocating for like the Grant Williams treatment or anything here. Uh, but he definitely needs to have a slightly smaller role until he starts being successful again, not through anything. I think he's doing intentionally wrong. I think this is just a bad series for him. Yeah. I, it's, it's weird how consistently reaching back to the Philly series, Boston is allowing individual defenders to just be put on like a pretty serious Island and Malcolm Brogdon just, it's not even sometimes it looks bad. It always looks bad when they pick pick on him on defense. And he, he does seem to be either forcing the issue or just like lacking in chemistry as a playmaker. Um, maybe he can survive as a spot-up shooter, but that's not really his game. So I, I agree with that. Um, I think something that was super important for the Celtics was at halftime, they had eight turnovers and Miami had seven, or is it the other way around? Oh, Justin's muted. Pregnant with pause. Apol- apologies on that. Yeah, no, the Boston was up eight to seven. Okay, because the final tally for Tony Arvos was ten for Boston and fifteen for Miami. Boston outscored. I'm doing this off the top of my head, so if I get a number wrong, sorry. But outscored Miami sixty six to forty three in the second half, and a huge part of that was ball control. Um, those eight Miami turnovers is a credit to Boston's defense. It wasn't great. But Miami's offense also wasn't great. Like, like in the first few games, Boston's defense has been pretty bad. But also, Miami's offense has been outstanding. So for every shot that the Celtics just straight up didn't contend, Miami would hit a shot that was well con- contested. This game, it felt like when Boston defended, Miami struggled. But then even when Boston didn't defend, Miami kind of struggled. And I don't know if that's a sustainable trend line, but it certainly helped the Celtics. I think Miami shot like 25% from three. Uh, Al Horford making shots. Thank God. Yeah, there's, we'll in a moment do an ad break and I will use that as a logical transition to talk about the next game. But again, this is like a selfish proposition because we write about the Celtics and we talk about the Celtics. It the, the stink around this team was so real no one was writing favorable stuff. No one had favorable things to say. Uh, There was not an excuse really to podcast about the Celtics in a favorable light or write about them in uh, in such a manner. And it just, I I don't know. I I, like reflexively find myself defending the team and the coach and the system because the, the conversation is so toxic. And I don't know what the actual homeostasis is like how much of those takes are fair and foul i think david aldridge had a really nice piece on this in the athletic but yeah i, I appreciated his take that, that people who are are freaking out about what joe mazula is doing for adjustments wouldn't know an adjustment if it hit them in the face it's not his words but basically his sentiment yeah like uh, i don't think I'm, i don't think this is inappropriate and we'll we'll break after this justin today in my pickup basketball game Again, as someone who professionally covers basketball, I turned to a team and I was like, are they playing zone right now? Because you can't, unless you are truly the cream of the crop of this stuff, it's not your it's not your lane. You're supposed to enjoy the entertainment product, not, not coach from the sideline. Anyways, let's pause the action. Let's talk about our friends over at FanDuel, and then we will pretend like we know what we're talking about, evidently. Just kidding. Justin knows a lot, and sometimes I, sometimes I string a few good things together. Anthropology, maybe. 
yeah well if we want to talk about dinosaurs i'm shout out to the prehistoric planet two viewers out there Make a break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now new customers can get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. I saw that the Boston Celtics are the title favorites for 2024 as of this morning. I'm sure that's changed a little bit, but uh, it looks like the Nuggets are the prohibitive favorites for the finals, however this shakes out. But already, if you're feeling optimistic about next year's Celtics, you can get in on that action. And there's no better place to bet all the playoff action, or I suppose next year's playoff action, than America's number one sportsbook. Visit FanDuel.com slash Boston and get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's FanDuel.com slash Boston. FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of the NBA. You must be 21 or older in select states. First online real money wager only. A $10 deposit is required. Refunds are issued as a non-withdrawable bonus bet that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See full terms at fanduel.com slash sportsbook. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com backslash RG for Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, or Virginia. You can call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text Next Step to 53342 for Arizona. Call one 88 Eight seven eight nine seven 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 seven, or visit ccpg.org slash chat for Connecticut. Call 1-800-9-WITH-IT for Indiana. Call 1-800-522-4700 or visit ksgamblinghelp.com for Kansas. Call 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit gamblinghelpma.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support for Massachusetts. Visit mdgamblinghelp.com. Dot org from Maryland, call one eight seven seven eight hope and y or to- text hope and y four six seven three six nine for New York. Call one eight hundred five two two four seven zero zero in Wyoming or visit one eight hundred gambler dot net in West Virginia. That's my Super Bowl. <laughs> this damn <laughs> FanDuel copy. Okay, uh, we got. I have, a, I have a question for you before we we move on, and it's something that has been dominating the news cycles. But when you really look at some of the major coaching decisions, including with some of the coaches who are on the market now, a ball going in or not has literally been the difference for some of them keeping their jobs. Do you think that this one was enough for Joe to at least buy himself some time? Uh, and if not, and why is it stupid either way? <laughs> yeah, that that you're really teeing me up for my strong opinion here, which is, look, it's a merciless business. And also these people are well compensated. I mean, there's something to that, I suppose, but like Budenholzer won my Milwaukee a championship and was going through a family tragedy and they pulled his plug. Right. Um, there is not Monty Williams is, is uh, like royalty in the NBA and such a good guy. They, they walked away from him. Um, I suspect the Celtics have a weird line to, to walk, which is a fourth coach in a fourth year is really bad. And like, what if this group underachieves again next year? Like, did you really paint yourself into a corner? Um, likewise, I think there's something to stability to say, you know what? Two weeks of bad basketball is not who we are. And it's not who Joe Missoula is. And we're, we're mature enough to roll it back. And I suspect that Brad Stevens couldn't care less about what the consensus is to say nothing of talk radio. Now that the, the, there's two things that I would push back on myself there first. And I've said this before, I think Jalen Brown gets to say, Hey, I'm not signing the extension until you hire X person or, Hey, I'm not signing an extension until you keep Joe Missoula. And I don't really know where he would come down on that. Second, I do think Missoula is not inspired so much tactically. Um, it, it is clear that Miami is comfortable trying many more defensive looks than the Celtics are. And I think that matters. You're muted again. Um, Tactically on defense, I think you're right. But on offense, I think he's he's brilliant. And as much as he gets very fair critique for leaving the Celtics kind of in the lurch uh, with really just one offensive approach, mm-hmm. when was he going to develop another one realistically given the lurch he leapt into? Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's on the players. It's a read offense and it's read offense they they handled really well through the regular season that a little bit of an aggressive zone or switching from man to zone through professional basketball players off is, 
is not really on the coach at a certain point. Like that's kind of, it's been an embarrassment for the players for my money. So I, I also think that his candor after game three was misrepresented. I don't think he said I lost the locker room. I think he was just being honest. Like, I don't know what else I could say. That doesn't mean like, look, I, I'm sorry if my students are listening right now. My students have a project that is due tomorrow. And already I've gotten a bunch of extension requests from students after previously saying to them, look, you need to manage your time better. Here's uh, here's a bunch of strategies you can use. Here's a couple extra days during class. And here is a script for if you need to ask for an extension, how to do it in a way that you don't embarrass yourself. And still, I'm getting like pretty embarrassing, frankly, students, if you're listening, some pretty bad emails right now asking for project extensions. And I'm not saying that Jason Tatum, Jayla Brown and company are... 15 year old students, but there's only so much you can do as a coach or a parent or a student, right? Like at a certain point, a horse led to water has to drink the GD water. I don't know if we're past the monetization point or not. So uh, I, I know you knew what my thoughts were, but I appreciate it nonetheless, because it would be standard operating procedure for a coach to get canned after coming up short, because that's how professional sports work. But it just all season long, it's been so easy to pick on Joe Missoula, and it's been it's been quickly very lazy and redundant. Um, There's plenty but, of stuff that's legitimate to criticize yeah, about his job and his situation and all of that. But as much as I think that they would not be out of line if they did choose to move on uh, in any situation that doesn't involve the Celtics advancing, at the same time, I think it's also healthier for us to push the debate back in the other direction because there's a very good chance that at this point Joe Mazzola is going to be the coach next season and we should wrap our heads around the fact that there's probably more going on in the situation than we're ever going to hear so let's be open let's not like freak out if that does happen yeah it's a good enough logical transition for me to pause and uh, talk to you all about our friends of our better help and BetterHelp is an online service that helps you conveniently connect with a, a therapist online. It's flexible and it's suited to your schedule. We, we sincerely really are happy to partner with BetterHelp. Um, it's kind of weird podcasting faux pas, but the past two episodes of the Ezra Klein podcast have been about teen mental health. And in particular, the second part has been about, uh, it, it's gendered and they admit that it, it, it's kind of overly gendered, but they talk about young boys and they say, you know, young boys aren't at risk for low level mental health challenges, but are more at risk for high level mental health challenges because they don't have the language to kind of work through the medium stuff. So younger girls present mental health more readily, but uh, younger boys end up with the most serious consequences at a higher clip. And part of that is talking about your feelings as a muscle that you have to build. And services like BetterHelp are, are such a low stakes way to to start that journey. Um, so better help can be about becoming a better thinker, a better talker. It can be about when you're succeeding in life, but if you're also down in the dumps, better help's a great service to consider. It starts with a brief questionnaire. You get matched with a licensed therapist and away you go. So discover your potential with better help. Visit betterhelp.com slash seltlab to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash seltlab. Okay, Dr. Q, it's it's me, your friend Mr. T. Let's talk about game five. What let's um we're we're past the point of monetization. I can use a swear word. Yeah, you can say whatever the shit you want. I was gonna say, let's build a shit sandwich. So what's something good you're looking forward to, something bad you're worried about, and something good that you might also be considering? Something good I'm looking forward to seeing more aggressive, engaged Rob Williams. This is the second game in a row that he has really been on the floor, ready to play, focused, not making stupid mistakes for the most part. Uh, there are a couple of errors, but I mean, no more than anyone else in that game. Uh, the inevitable comfort that comes from playing at home, I'm very worried about. Uh, it was mm-hmm. mentioned. I forget who was saying on the broadcast, but the, the, the point that was made by the broadcast, the TNT broadcast crew, that when you are at home, you are more comfortable, and that can be a double-edged sword. It's very, very true, particularly with the Celtics group. I mean, I don't want to say, you know, it, it's better to go out at home than anywhere else because it was really not great to go out at home in the finals last season uh, on their own court. But I do hope that 
being at home and having the crowd uh, hopefully showing up and giving the business to the Miami Heat in a way that hasn't really happened in this series yet is another good thing to be looking forward to to complete my cockadoo sandwich. I heard the word cockadoo in a while. Um, yeah, Rob, Rob was fantastic, I thought. He's, I don't know, defensively, they're, they're asking him to do too much. Bam Adebayo has been so good. Uh, so much has been made of, of Miami's bench and Jimmy Butler, obviously, but Bam, I, I don't know. It's just like spectacular. And it's like really throwing the Celtics off the defense to have this, like, it, he's not like running points, but they're using him to initiate a lot of the offense in a way that like it really messes with Rob. And then thus it messes with the rest of the defense. It's been a spectacular uh, choice by the the heat and such a luxury for them. Okay. Anyways, well, I guess that could be my shit sandwiches if, Bam disrupts Boston's defense again. Uh, I'm looking for a second half performance at, at this point. The the woes of last season. I mean, how many times did we talk about fourth quarter collapses last season under a different head coach? Imagine that. Um, I, I just, I think that still lives in their DNA. They kind of looked like they might've choked away this one as well. So I, I'm really looking forward to a strong third quarter. Jason Tatum seems like he, is really increasingly playing his best in the third quarter. I think that'd be really valuable. Um, I'll, I'll say the middle part of my, my shitty sandwich is bam, picking apart the Celtics defense because he's been really good at it. And then finally, uh, even if they lose, if it is a strong effort, the tenor of the season superficially or not changes. If they get hosed or waxed, big time they stunk they stunk they stunk and all the difficult questions are on the table if they lose the wire or they lose in fair enough fashion and it's a gentleman's sweep there's something way more salvageable about that even though it still doesn't look very good and it's still quite underwhelming least of which and we've said this before look miami's an eight seed and they dismantled the bucks they punished the Knicks, and look what they're doing to the Celtics. This is clearly a team of destiny, and sometimes you until gotta, they're not, until they're not, or sometimes you got to get out of the way. Um, I just so want to see really aggressive, intense defense because, particularly with the Miami Heat and the fact that their best chance to score on that defense, for whatever reason, because of the zone, is to get down the court before it forms. Just it has to be. One with defense. If they're going to win game game uh, five, yeah, five. Game five. <laughs> I'm shell shocked at this point. Uh, then it's going to be with defense. Well, let's pause there. Let's not pretend like this wasn't game four. And that look, the series could end as soon as Thursday, but it could only go as late as Monday. So one way or the other, we will have an answer on this soon enough. And hopefully, you like our podcast. I'd have to come back for some more good or bad or ugly. So uh, let's talk about that. We have got a little bit of news that we got to cover. Hey, you want to do the coaches? Uh, not the coaches per se, but uh, there's another series that uh, is oh, not sure. continuing. Um, yeah, Nikola Jokic is if Magic Johnson and Kareem Abdul Jabbar created some sort of Serbian hybrid. I mean, it's fascinating what he's able to do. And he just he dresses like he is like a horse jockey in the 1930s and he has my body shape and he was the most preposterous my body shape what are you talking about you're at least vaguely healthy jeez anyway you've only seen me from the shoulder up um he gets no lift on his jump shot it's just it's gorgeous it's weird it's like truly he was the unicorn in waiting this whole time um Jamal Murray has been so, so good. And Mike Malone is really, really feeling himself with the mic. I'm loving this Denver team. Uh, I'm curious what happens next. I think, obviously, again, for lots of reasons, I'd like to see what the Nuggets can do against the Celtics. But the Heat and the Nuggets play such different styles. And Jimmy Butler and uh, Jokic are such different stars and It'd be so fa- It'd be such a fascinating matchup. I really I mean, hate. I think it's Denver's year, no matter who ends up coming out of this series. Honestly, I don't. I don't want to sound negative, but it, I'm just going to shut up. 
I'm not going to look any gift horses in the mouth. I'm not going to make any negative projections. Uh, anything is possible. Yeah. And um, it wasn't conscious, but it was right of us to not talk about the Lakers first because that has been frustrating. LeBron is so good for him uh, for <laughs> just saying like, hey, maybe I'll retire. So you have to talk about me. I also am and someone maybe who, if you want me to come back, you better do some shit with this team. Yeah, well, there's that too. Yeah, good luck with Kyrie. Although Trey Young and Kyrie showing up multiple games in a row is kind of pathetic. Like you, Kyrie didn't even show up for his own Celtics team when they were in the playoffs. I don't know. We can't end on the Kyrie note. What do you? What else do you want to talk about? How are you, how's your uh, cat? <laughs> yeah, no, there there is an interesting cameo in a popular new movie. I just rewatched the original last night. Uh, Got my wife to watch it with me. She made it halfway through, which is an accomplishment for her because she's not a big basketball fan. Uh, that would be a white man can't jump. Uh, do you know who the cameo is? Or the cameos, I should say. Uh, first of all, I'm going to... Yes, and I emailed that person's representation to see if they wanted to plug the movie on the podcast. And they said, we're a little busy right now. Um, <laughs> no, they were well, really... Are they though? One of neither, <laughs> neither of them really are, are they? I mean, they could be. They could be. True. It was, um, it's Blake. We're talking about Blake Griffin, uh, who and Tyler who, Harrow of the Tyler Harrow, yeah. yeah, he looks like he would be in that movie. I have a, I, I'm a real big supporter of Blake Griffin's increasing portfolio off the court activities, but I just don't get that movie being made. Uh, yeah. Because I also rewatched the original, like I guess a month ago. At this it's so point. good! I have not seen the original. Is it good? Or the, you had the new one. The new no, one. I'm not. I'm not going to watch that crap. Yeah, the original holds up. I mean, there's like, there's a little bit of the dialogue and the acting that it's like, oh, this movie's thirty something years old, but it's still good. And also, it seems like the new movie's the literally exact same plot, which is so. They could have changed up a little bit. Anyway. Yeah, I don't know. I I know that everyone likes Jack Harlow. I just don't get it. I, and I'm not like I like young celebrities. I'm not like old man on my porch here. I, I just, haven't even heard him because I am an old man on the porch. <laughs> All right, well, Jack Harlow, if you're listening, come on the podcast and we'll get to know you, and maybe we'll change your mind. But until then, good luck to Doc Rivers in Phoenix or something. I maybe, don't know, or maybe Nick Nurse. Yeah, there's there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. We'll just tweet it about it. I haven't read it yet, but yeah, I'm actually checking my phone to see if we missed any. Uh, new updates doesn't look like it alrighty well Nick Nurse you can also come on the podcast if you're listening anyone anyone can come on at this point Um, just make sure you like and subscribe Nick Nurse if you show us that you liked and subscribe to our podcast you can come on you can talk about whatever you want that's the deal we're willing to strike alright thanks everyone Uh, happy game 4 to all who observed and um, buckle up It's, it's only game 5 on Thursday but best of luck to the Celtics and best of luck to the Heat for you know having fun and I'm just rambling so you can hear the outro music. Adios.